you're a credible-looking audience. Good morning. morning. And welcome to the Winston C. Doby Lecture Series. I'm Charles Alexander, the Associate Vice Provost for Student Diversity and Director of the Academic Advancement Program. Each year, we invite distinguished thinkers from across the country to address our community on topics related to higher education access and social justice, issues that Dr. Doby passionately advocated for throughout his career. Today, we are here to honor Dr. Doby's legacy, one that continues to be felt across our campus. As you know, Dr. Doby believed that the best way to improve the lives of first-generation, low-income, and underrepresented students was to provide them with an educational experience that would empower them to become change agents and leaders in their communities. His crowning achievement at UCLA was the Academic Advancement Program, one of the nation's most successful student academic support programs. Today, AAP provides thousands of students with educational resources necessary to ensure that they have what they need to build a better future for themselves and their families. I can't think of a better way to honor Dr. Doby's legacy and to continue fulfilling his dream for social justice than to welcome Congressman John Lewis to our campus. And I would have suspect that had they met, these two remarkable and courageous men would have certainly drawn inspiration from one another. Well, today I hope you enjoyed today's program, and I hope that you continue to engage with our campus and with AAP for the many years to come. Now it is my great pleasure to present to you UCLA's Chancellor, Gene Block. Good morning and welcome to UCLA. I'm thrilled to welcome Congressman John Lewis to our campus and to see such a wide cross-section in our community. Your presence here today speaks of the importance of this day during such a pivotal moment in our nation's history. For more than half a century, John Lewis has been one of the strongest and most enduring voices of the American conscience. He is a visionary who has changed our nation through his courage to practice nonviolence in the face of hostility, through his tireless efforts on the behalf of humanity, and through his belief that a shared commitment to truth can bridge even the deepest divide. For nearly a century, UCLA has been a beacon of hope and opportunity a sanction for freedom of thought and expression, and an engine of change and progress for the people of Los Angeles, California, and our nation. So Congressman Lewis, I hope you feel at home here, and you know that UCLA shares your commitment to compassion and integrity, to equality and respect, and that we share your belief that we are stronger when we work together. Just as you have done, UCLA will continue to encourage our people, young and old, to take a stand against injustice. And to our audience, especially to our students who are with us today, I hope you'll be inspired by what, you, by what you'll hear today. In March of 1965, which is not so long ago for some of us, at a peaceful march in Alabama, John Lewis and hundreds of others were brutally attacked by those who wanted to deny voting rights to African Americans. History would record that day as Bloody Sunday. Mr. Lewis, who was only asking that his nation keep the promise it made to him, suffered a concussion merely for insisting that he be treated equally. Let's not mince words. Congressman John Lewis is quite simply a living legend, a man 
who at 25 years old was committed to changing the world and willing to risk his life in order to do so. From his time as chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee when he organized student activism for civil rights, to his decades of service in Congress, he has dedicated his life to equality and fairness. He has never wavered on an issues important to our nation, never stood still when confronted with injustice, never allowed us to forget our past or to give up on a better future. In his own words, we don't want to go back, we want to go forward. No doubt our students can learn from Congressman Lewis's extraordinary example that they too can be agents of change and progress, that they can find common ground through reason, discourse, and understanding, that they can learn how their powerful voices can add together if they work together. We are so grateful for Congressman Lewis for his sacrifices, sacrifices that have made it possible for us to be here today at a, uni at a university that is home to black intellectuals and activists, artists and educators, scientists and engineers, leaders in nearly every field, scholars whose contributions not only have bettered our society, but have also made UCLA into a world-class institution. Today, we welcome Congressman Lewis to our campus's most iconic space to bestow upon him our highest honor, the UCLA Medal. The UCLA Medal was established in 1979 as the university's highest honor. It's reserved for individuals who have made truly extraordinary contributions to their professions, to higher education, to our society, and to the people of UCLA. Previous recipients include heads of state, renowned scientists, artists and scholars, peacemakers, social reformers, and giants of commerce. Today, we are very proud to add the name of Congressman Lewis to that distinguished roster. It is now my privilege, and one of the greatest I have had since becoming chancellor, to present Congressman John Lewis with the UCLA Medal. The UCLA Medal bears the university's seal on one side and a depiction of Royce Hall on the other. The medal is accompanied by a citation which reads as follows. John Robert Lewis, a courageous hero of the civil rights movement and a widely respected member of the United States Congress, you have selflessly dedicated your life to securing civil liberties for your fellow Americans. You have provided moral leaderships, through some of the most seminal moments in the struggle for justice, repeatedly risking your life for the greater good. You're con you continue to stand tall as a vanguard of progressive social movements, advancing education, voter rights, the democratic process, and equality for all. For your unwavering faith in humanity and your untiring fight for a better world, we proudly bestow upon you the UCLA Medal. Congratulations. Chancellor Block, members of the General Council Regent, Regent, members of the UCLA family, I'm honored to be honored with this medal. <laughs> this is almost too much. I am delighted pleased and very happy to be here. For a poor boy who grew up in rural Alabama, preaching to chickens, 
trying to baptize some of those chickens <laughs> to be receiving this medal. I'm honored and delighted to deliver this year Winston C. Darby Distinguished Lecture. To see some of the Freedom Riders here, to see Jim Lawson, And I know there's so many of you here that I cannot see from where I am, but I know you're here. So my beloved brothers and sisters, and to all of the members of the faculty, staff, and to all of the wonderful students, thank you for all that you do to help create what Martin Luther King Jr. called the beloved community. Now, I grew up in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little place called Troy. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was four years old, and I do remember when I was four, how many of you remember when you were four? <laughs> My father had saved $300, and with the $300, a man sold him 100 and 10 acres of land. My family still own this land today. <laughs> on this farm, we raise a lot of cotton and corn, peanuts, hogs, cows, and chickens. I don't eat too many peanuts today. I eat so many peanuts when I was growing up. I just don't want to see any more peanuts. <laughs> Sometime, I would be out there working in the field. Picking cotton, gathering peanuts, pulling corn. And my mother would say, boy, you're falling behind. You need to catch up. And I would say, this is hard work. And she would say, boy, hard work never killed anybody. I said, well, it's about to kill me. <laughs> but growing up there, it became my responsibility, as I stated, to care for the chickens, and I fell in love with raising chickens. I know here at UCLA, you're very, very smart. You're gifted, but you don't know anything about raising chickens. <laughs> when I was a little boy, I had to take the fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen, and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. Some of you may be saying, John Lewis, why do you mark those fresh eggs with a pencil before you place them under the setting hen? Well, from time to time, another hen would get on that same nest, and there would be some more fresh eggs. You had to be able to tear the fresh eggs from the eggs that were already under the setting hen. And when the setting hen eggs were hatch, I would fool these setting hens. I would cheat on these setting hens. I would take these little chicks and get them to another hen. Get some more fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under their setting hen, and wait for three long weeks for the new chicks to be hatched. I kept on cheating on these setting hens. It was not the right thing to do. It was not the moral thing to do. It was not the most loving thing to do. It was not the most democratic thing to do. It was not the most nonviolent thing to do. But I just couldn't save enough money to buy an incubator, a hatcher from the Cicero Buck store. Now, students, you're too young to know anything about the Cicero Buck catalog. It's a big book, a heavy book, a thick book. Some people call it the wish book. I wish I had this, I wish I had that. So I just kept on wishing. And I would preach to those chickens, I would baptize those chickens, and some of those chickens would bow their heads, some of those chickens would shake their heads, they never quite said amen. <laughs> but I'm convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to in the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listened to me today in the Congress. <laughs> As a matter of fact, some of those chickens were just a little more productive. At least they produce eggs. Well, that's enough of that. When we would visit the little town of Troy, visit Montgomery, visit Tuskegee, I would see those signs that said white men 
colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. I would ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great grandparents, why? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way. Don't go in trouble. Don't get in trouble. Stay out of trouble. To go downtown on a Saturday afternoon to see a movie, all of us little black children had to go upstairs to the balcony, and all of the little white children went downstairs to the first floor. I kept saying, why? My family kept saying, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. Don't get in the way. Don't get in trouble. But in 1955, 15 years old, in the 10th grade, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on our radio. The action of Rosa Parks, the words and leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. inspired me to find a way to get in the way. And I got in the way. I got in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. I was so inspired by the action taking place in Montgomery, just 50 miles away, that in 1956, 16 years old, with some of my brothers and sisters and cousins, we went down to the public library, trying to get library cards, trying to check out some books. And we were told by the librarian that the library was for whites only and not for colors. I never went back to that library until July 5th, 1998, for a book signing of my first book, Walking with the Wind. <laughs> By this time, I'm in the Congress. On that day, I signed a lot of books. We had refreshment. At the end of the program, they gave me a library card. It says something about the distance we've come and the progress we've made in laying down the burden of race. When I was in school, the poorly staffed, overcrowded middle school and later high school I had a wonderful teacher who said, read, read my child, read. I tried to read everything. We had very few books in our home. We were too poor to have a subscription to the local newspaper, but my grandfather had one, and he would pass his newspaper on to us each day. He kept up recovering events, and I was deeply inspired to try to do something. I wanted to attend a little college 10 miles from my home called Troy State College, now known as Troy University. Submitted my high school transcript. I never heard a word from the school. So I wrote a letter to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and told him I needed his help. I didn't tell my mother, my father, any of my teachers. Dr. King wrote me back and sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket and invited me to come to Montgomery to meet with him. In the meantime, I had been accepted at a little school in Nashville, Tennessee. An uncle of mine gave me a $100 bill more money than I ever had, gave me a foot locker. I put everything that I own in that foot locker, except my chickens, and took a Greyhound bus to Nashville, Tennessee. And it was in Nashville, Tennessee, that I met Jim Lawson, this unbelievable man, this unbelievable philosopher who taught us the way of peace, the way of love, taught us the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. He inspired us to stand up, to speak up, to speak out, and to do what we could to redeem the city of Nashville, and by doing so, we can help redeem America. We got involved in the sit-ins. Black and white college students and some high school students We'll be sitting there in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion, waiting to be served. And someone would come up and spit on us, put a lighted cigarettes out in our hair or down our backs, pour hot water, 
hot coffee on us. And I remember one day we were told that if we continue to sit in, we may get arrested. We may go to jail. I'd never been arrested before. I never gone to jail. I remember what my mother and my father said, my grandparents and great grandparents, don't get in trouble. But I thought if I were going to get arrested and go to jail, I wanted to look what students back then called fresh, <laughs> clean, sharp. So I went to a used men's store in downtown Nashville and bought a used suit. A vest came with it. And when I was arrested with 89 students on February 27, 1960, I felt fresh. I looked fresh. I felt sharp. It was a liberating feeling. And throughout sit-ins and later the Freedom Ride, just think students in 1961, the same year that President Barack Obama was born, black people and white people could not be seated together on a Greyhound or Trailway bus leaving the nation's capital to travel through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, through Mississippi. We were on our way to New Orleans to test a decision of the United States Supreme Court. We were beaten, left bloody, Rock Hill, South Carolina, Birmingham, Alabama, Montgomery, Arrested in jail in Jackson, Mississippi. We filled the city jail, the county jail. We were taken to the state penitentiary at Parchment. But we never gave up. We never lost hope. We kept the faith. And I said today as students, as young people, you must use your education, use your training to help change America and create the beloved community. When you see something that is not fair, not right, you have a moral obligation, a mission, and a mandate to speak up, speak out, and get in the way and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. We have come a distance. We have made a lot of progress. But as a nation and as a people, as part of the world community, we have a great distance to go. There are too many people, too many of our brothers and sisters have been left out and left behind. You have an obligation to play your role and play it so well that no one else can play it any better. There have been so many unbelievable and outstanding graduates of this university, of this great institution. So many that I got to know. Kareen, saw him last evening, Jabbar. Arthur Ashe, Tom Bradley, Ralph Bunch, came to Selma and marched with us across the bridge. There are still people today that need people to march with them, to stand up for them and speak up for them. I think it's a shame and a disgrace in America in the 21st century that we have hundreds, thousands, and millions of people living in fear we need comprehensive immigration reform and set people on a path to citizenship. I got arrested 40 times during the 60s. And since I've been in Congress another five times,
My last arrest was trying to get the Speaker of the House to bring forth comprehensive immigration reform bill. If he had brought this bill to the floor of the House, we would have passed it, and President Barack Obama would sign it into law. It doesn't make sense for hundreds and thousands and millions of people, including young children, to be living in fear on this little piece of real estate that we call America. That's not right. That's not fair. That is not just. As we move to create an open society, to create the beloved community, as we move to redeem the soul of America, we all must be engaged. We must not give up. We must not lose hope. So never get lost in a sea of despair. Keep the faith. Be hopeful. Be optimistic. Pick them up. Put them down. Be brave, courageous. Be bold. And do what you must do in an orderly, peaceful, non violent fashion, and we will get there. Yes, as the Chancellor said, and I said a few short years ago, we come too far, we made too much progress, and we're not going back, we're going forward. Some people on that March, on March 7, 1965, gave everything they had. During those days of walking from Selma to Montgomery, some people were beaten. One woman was shot, murdered. One young minister was beaten almost to death in the streets of Selma and later died in the hospital in Birmingham. I, along with others, gave a little blood for the right to vote. There are forces in America today, in the 21st century, trying to make it harder and more difficult for people to participate in the democratic process. The vote is powerful. It is almost sacred in a democracy. It is precious. It is the most powerful nonviolent instrument or tool that we have, and we must use it. So I said to you as students, as young people, get out there and vote in every election and run for office. We need more of you standing up, running, speaking up, and speaking out. I want to tell you one little story. I know some of you are saying this is out of the ordinary. This is not a typical lecture. I agree with you. <laughs> but when I was growing up in rural Alabama during the 40s and the 50s, I had an aunt by the name of Seneva. And my aunt Seneva lived in what we call a shotgun house. I know here in this great state, in this beautiful city, you've never seen a shotgun house. You don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> My Aunt Seneva lived in this unbelievable house. She didn't have a green manicured lawn. Had a simple, plain, dirt yard. And sometime at night, you can look up through the holes, through the ceiling, through the holes in the tin roof, and come to stars. Sometimes she would walk out into the woods and cut branches from a dogwood tree and make a brush broom. And she would sweep this dirt yard very clean, especially on the weekend, on a Friday or Saturday, because she wanted that dirt yard to look good on Saturday or on Sunday. But one Saturday afternoon, 
a group of my brothers and sisters and a few of my first cousins, about 12 or 15 of our young children, a lot of young brothers and sisters and others right there, playing in her dirt yard. And an unbelievable storm came up. The wind started blowing, the thunder started rolling, the lightning started flashing, and the rain started beating on the tin roof of this old shotgun house. And my aunt got us all together and told us to hold hands. But in one corner of this old house appeared to be lifting. She had us to walk to that side to try to hold the house down with our little bodies. When the other corner appeared to be lifting, had us to walk to that corner. We were little children walking with the wind, but we never, ever left the house. You must never, ever leave a trimming house. Call it the American house. Call it the house of California. Call it the house of Los Angeles. Call it the house of UCLA. We all live in the same house. We're brothers and sisters. We're one people. We're one family. We're part of the world house. We're part of the world community. And we must learn to live together, as Dr. King said, as brothers and sisters. If not, we will perish as fools. A. Philip Randolph, the great labor leader, put it another way. Maybe our foremothers and our forefathers all came to this great land in different ships. But we're all in the same boat now. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether we're black or white. Latino, Asian American, or Native American, whether we're straight or gay, we're one people, we're one family. Let us all learn to live together and be one. We can do it. We must do it. If we get it right here in America, we can serve as a model for the rest of the world. Use your education for good. You can do it. Thank you very much. All I can say is, wow. Um, my name is Tyrone Howard. I'm a professor of education here in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. And it is our uh, distinct honor and privilege, Congressman Lewis, to have you here with us. Uh, on behalf of this entire UCLA community, I just want to say thank you for your struggle, thank you for your sacrifice, and thank you for your sustaining the vision of equality and justice for all Americans. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a little bit of time together. Um, we're going to make this intimate, like it's just you and I here talking. Okay. Right? We, we, we don't see these other folks no, no, out here. Right? Um, but uh, it's truly uh, an honor uh, and a privilege for me to engage with someone who has sacrificed so much. And so I just, I just want to engage you for a few minutes to ask you some questions about your commitment and some recommendations you might offer to students of today. So one of the things that comes to mind, for example, is the fact that we live in a deeply divided time that's highly partisan, uh, where lots of constituents don't believe that congresspersons are uh, doing all that they can to make this country better. What advice would you offer uh, to any students at a place like UCLA who are considering going into politics or public service? What should they know? What recommendations might you offer? Well, I would suggest, uh, first of all, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. You know, the only thing I, I just been trying to help out. Uh, just trying to help out. Uh, as a child, as I tried to state, I didn't like what I saw, and I was inspired to do something about it. 
But public service, I think, is a calling. Mm -hmm. um, Martin Luther King Jr. inspired me. Mm -hmm. He, uh, in some ways of fashion, if it hadn't been for Dr. King and Rosa Parks, I don't know what would have happened to me. Mm -hmm. But it, these individuals taught me to stand up, mm -hmm. to speak up and speak out. Mm -hmm. And Dr. James Lawson taught me, uh, just, just go for it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and be yourself. Um, we need more young people That's right. and to go into public service. Mm -hmm. It's a calling. After the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., I was with Robert Kennedy campaigning with him in Indianapolis, Indiana, when we heard that Dr. King had been assassinated. And I said to myself, we still have Bobby. And I came to this state, I came to this city and campaigned with him. I was in the Ambassador Hotel in his suite when he was shot. And what happened to Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy, two months apart, I made up my mind then that I would commit my life to public service. Um, <laughs> we lost, we lost so much. Uh, I remember meeting with President Kennedy in 1963, after the march on Washington. He, you know, in the beginning, he was not that open to the whole idea of a march on Washington. But when he saw it was gonna take place, he became supportive. Mm -hmm. And when the march was all over, he uh, invited us down to the White House, he met us in the door of the Oval Office, he was beaming like a proud father. He kept saying to each one of us, you did a good job, you did a good job. Mm -hmm. And when, we got, when he got to Dr. King, he said, you did a good job and you had a dream. It was my last time seeing President Kennedy. Mm -hmm. for he was assassinated in November 1963. And I think with the assassination of President Kennedy, Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy, Something died in America. Mm -hmm. Something died in all of us. That innocent, mm -hmm. that sense of hope. Mm -hmm. And we cannot let it, that sense of hope be buried forever. And I know that there are people that are sort of down right now, but we must not be down. Right. We must get up mm -hmm. and push mm -hmm. and be happy and engage. I'd like to see more women, more young people out there pushing. I think the Women March was one of the most moving effort I've seen in a long time, really. I agree, uh, I agree. Mm -hmm. So you were involved in Students for Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC. Uh, you were one of the chairs of SNCC. Uh, you all went through some intense training uh, to prepare for some of the hostility that you would encounter. Uh, you spent months preparing for all the kinds of things that would be said to you, uh, things that would be done to you. What are some takeaways that students can take from that same kind of discipline and the same kind of training you all had to endure to go into places like Selma and Montgomery? Well, I would suggest that the students should read the literature, uh, read the books and the, the papers, um, watch the film footage. It's a great piece that NBC did, the NBC white paper on the city of Nashville. Mm -hmm. Um, Jim Lawson, this unbelievable teacher, was conducting these nonviolent workshops at a little Methodist church uh, near Fish University in Nash, long before uh, we were going to, to sit in. Mm -hmm. uh, so every Tuesday night, a group of students, small group, would come and learn and role playing and social drama. Mm -hmm. and that was a comic book that came out called Martin Luther King Jr. and the Montgomery Story mm -hmm. that the uh, Jim organization helped distribute. Mm -hmm. Dr. King was one of the editors of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, it sold for 10 cents, 16 pages, 
Some of my friends and others said today, too many young people know very little about the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. They have, it's like maybe um, 10 words, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and I have a dream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we need to educate, we need That's to inform right. people mm -hmm. that another generation, we didn't have a website. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah, word of mouth, right? Right. We, 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 we didn't have, uh, in many places, a, a fax machine. Mm -hmm. we, we had an old mimeograph machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, all right. that ink and right, right. turning the thing. That's and right, that's right. right. Well, one of your teachers is here today. Reverend Lawson, I believe, is here, correct? Can, can Reverend Lawson, can we acknowledge? No, okay. Well, maybe not. There he is. Because of the leadership of Jim Lawson, so many people, unbelievable people, came out of the Nashville movement mm -hmm. and became leaders in local movements and elected officials. Martin Luther King Jr. would come to Nashville and speak from time to time on Fish University campus at a church, and he would say that the Nashville movement was the most disciplined. And we would say that Jim Lawson had a greater understanding of the philosophy mm -hmm. and the discipline of nonviolence than anyone he knew. Outstanding, outstanding. So I want to ask you about today's political climate. Do you, do you find it, you refer to oftentimes as the conscious of the Congress. Uh, is it difficult sometimes to establish some healthy working relationships with members of the other party when there's oftentimes such deep division? The only thing I would say, uh, brother, uh, I've seen better days. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, um, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's tough, mm -hmm. it is hard, mm -hmm. but it will not last forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We get out and do what we must do. That's right. That's right. So, so you're optimistic that one day, soon hopefully, we'll be able to put aside petty, petty partisan politics and do what's best for the people, especially the most vulnerable people in this country. I am, I am very, very hopeful, very optimistic that this too shall pass. Um, I don't understand it why in the proposed budget right now we want to cut certain programs like Meals on Wheels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's not much money to help our seniors, That's right. to help our veterans, mm -hmm. to cut the arts, mm -hmm. the National mm -hmm. Endowment for the Arts, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to cut um, the National Institute of Health, mm -hmm. or to cut CDC. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are some people believe in research. Mm -hmm. They don't believe in climate change. That's right. And uh, that's why we need more gifted, smart, young people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to get involved and get out there and push and pull. That's right, that's right. So one of the things you may not know is uh, Ava DuVernay is a director, noted alum of UCLA. She I directed the movie Selma. I, I know that. Right. And I so, should have called her name. I know that. <laughs> so I want to ask you, what do you think of the movie Selma? I and love the movie. I, I love the movie. I, I thought it, well, you know, she had a young person playing me. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> he did look something like me. Right, right, was, right. You also right. made a cameo in it as well. You were in Well, the you know, um, I, I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but. She did a good job, a yeah. great job. Mm -hmm. And I think she was robbed of a major um, award. I agree, I agree, I agree. <laughs> Two things. One, uh, the president made some comments that I thought were unfair about your district in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's okay. I don't think he did his research, right? Yeah. Uh, what would you like to tell folks about your, your, your district in Atlanta? That in the 5th Congressional District of Georgia include almost all of the city of Atlanta. The Atlanta airport is in the district. It's the largest commercial airport in the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's a wonderful district. It, colleges and universities, you know, Morehouse, Spelman, Clark Atlanta University, Georgia State uh, 
Georgia Tech, Emory, mm -hmm. um, so many wonderful places. There's people moving there. It's growing. Metro Atlanta is almost six million people, mm -hmm. and it's still growing. People are coming from all over the world to live there. If it was so bad, you know, people wouldn't be coming there. <laughs> right. um, but, uh, you know, he said that uh, something like I talk, 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 you know, action, but other people took care of that. Uh, I, I, would, I would just ask him to come and walk in my shoes. There you go. And part of what should be noted <laughs> is that you've been elected, re-elected 14 times in that district, right? 14 times. So if it was that bad, if it was that awful, I think folks would have, would have, would have, voted with their conscience and voted you out. But the fact that they keep reelecting you says something about the important work that you've been doing there. So thank you for your service there. Um, I want to mention also, uh, you talked about the March on Washington. Folks may not know, but you were the youngest speaker on the program that day. And you were also the last living member uh, who spoke on that event that day. Can you tell us what some of your takeaways were? What did you think about after that day uh, where you saw all these thousands of people out on the Mall of Washington? Well, it was uh, very moving, very, very moving that day. Uh, I was 23. I spoke number six. Dr. King spoke number 10. And I remember so well when A. Philip Randolph, this dean of black leadership, this wonderful man, this labor leader, introduced me. He said, now I present to you young John Lewis the national chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And I stood up and I said to myself, this is it. I looked to my right, I saw all of these young people, looked straight ahead, I saw just hundreds and thousands of people. Looked to the left, I saw a group of young men, white and African American, up in the trees, trying to get a better view of the podium. You know, it was just very, very moving. You know, uh, some of the observers said it was about 250,000 people. Uh, I don't want to go where somebody else is going. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, uh, I, I think it was more. It's a couple more, huh? Yeah, a couple more. Yeah, a couple more. Right, right. <laughs> so one of the things that some some uh, folks in this country worry about is do their elected officials listen to them? Do they hear them? Uh, what is it that constituents can do to get the attention of their elected officials? What gets your attention when someone well, when calls? Well, pe when writes? people call, uh, uh, I spend a lot of time in, out on the streets, listening, talking to people, going to a different restaurant, dropping in at a barber shop, not to get my hair cut. Yeah, or, we had the same haircut right. there. Yeah, yeah. But just to Check, we have a place in Atlanta, a little restaurant called Pascas, and you have to go by and check on that precinct. You call mm -hmm. it a, the Pasca precinct. Mm -hmm. Or you go to a, a barber shop, or you just go in the streets. And, and I check in with the Atlanta office, mm -hmm. as well as the Washington office when I'm not in Washington. So what are people calling about? Mm -hmm. uh, people used to write a, a lot of letters, but you get emails. Uh, you just have to stay in tune mm -hmm. with people. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I spend time uh, going to schools. Mm -hmm. You go to an elementary school, and you get down on the floor. <laughs> and, Don't get down here. No, no, okay, I won't yeah. get down. <laughs> I may not be able to get up. You know? Right, right. <laughs> but, you, but you get down on the floor with the little children, mm -hmm. and they would tell you everything you want to know. Right, and, right, and, right. And ask you all, right, uh, right after, uh, I went to a school right after President Obama uh, was elected in uh, elementary school, and the kids want to know how did I vote. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, you know, that's, you have a secret ballot. Right, right. And one little boy said, I know how you voted, John Lewis, you know. <laughs> and so right, right. I said, you're right, yeah, brother. Yeah, that's yeah. the way I did it. <laughs> Speaking, speaking of getting on the floor, so last winter, you led a, what I thought was a, a, a really inspirational a sit-in. Uh, yes, yes. Um, 
around the, uh, the, the shooting at the Orlando nightclub where uh, too many innocent victims lost their lives. How did your colleagues respond? I mean, I wish I was there with you. I was so moved and inspired because I saw you on the floor for what, 26, 28 hours. Uh, do your colleagues come to you, especially those who were not in agreement with you, do they ever come to you and, and, and really see and understand what it is that you were standing for? Or sitting for, in this case? Right, well, we were sitting, well, sometime by sitting in or sitting down, you're really standing up, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what we were doing. Uh, there's been too much gun violence mm -hmm. and just a proliferation of, of guns in our country. And um, we just start talking. And members came to me and said, what should we do, John? Mm -hmm. And we organized it in a matter of a few hours, and we decided to sit in the world of the of the house. Mm -hmm. Never in the history of America, never in the history of the, of the House of Representatives that a group of members, and almost every single Democratic member except one or two participated. To this day, mm -hmm. so, so almost 200 members. Wow. And to this day, um, I don't think a single Republican member has said anything uh, except a speaker called us in to talk to us. But uh, you know, some people call it sort of radical, mm -hmm. but when you see something that is so wrong, mm -hmm. you have to take some steps out of the ordinary mm -hmm. to dramatize it, to make it plain, mm -hmm. to make it real. Yeah, thank you for your commitment on that. Thank you for your commitment. So our time is coming to an end. Um, some folks wonder, Congressman, do you have any guilty pleasures? Do you like watch Real Housewives of Atlanta or <laughs> do you like, like, like splurge out on like chocolate ice cream? Or what's, what, what's one of your guilty pleasures that folks may not know about well, you? Well, I, I like ice cream. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I like to, um, when I see, some chicken someplace. <laughs> um, I, I feel sort of guilty about Which eating is, a yeah. piece of chicken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometime I, I wish I could raise chicken mm -hmm. uh, on Capitol Hill in D.C. <laughs> uh, uh, that I could raise some chickens in Atlanta, but mm -hmm. I, I cannot, you know, cannot do it. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I love being around young people, and especially. Mm -hmm. children, because mm -hmm. they're so gifted and so many other young people are so smart and they just, just need an opportunity. That's right. That's and right. Uh, when I can inspire young people uh, to go for it, yes. uh, I love to be there yeah. in the mix. Yes. And I tell my colleagues, just, just go for it. Just, just do it. it. Just do it. Do the right thing. Yeah. Well, you've provided a wonderful, inspirational example for all of us to follow. And so I can't say again uh, enough. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you. And one final thing, please. We know that you're an avid reader, uh, and of course you're here at a university, so we've taken the liberty uh, to ask a number of the faculty here from UCLA to provide books that have been authored by members on this campus. So right here you have two bookshelves that you're gonna have to take back on the plane with you. <laughs> but these are books from UCLA faculty. We thought that they could be used as part of your library just as a small token of appreciation for all the wonderful and, and outstanding commitments you've made thank to you. us. So thank you so well, much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman John Lewis.